Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. Today, myself and the food team have pulled together four really interesting cooking methods or approaches from around the world and we're going to see if we can make our normals go WTF. What's this fascinating food? Oh, WTF. Oh, flip it out. The first one is under the cloche. May I? Please do. It's empty. It's a bowl. <laughs> there are certain pots you cook in, like tagine, that were unusual to me once upon a time. Yes. Is it like, is there a lid to go with it to make it cook in a certain way? Not a lid, but there is a base for it to sit on. This is a dolsot or a stone pot from Korea. And we're going to ask you to create in it bibimbap. I, this is cool. I have no idea what you're talking about. You heat it up and put stuff in it and it makes the rice go crispy, does it? Yes! Oh. So we have eaten them before and we have done one on the channel before but not the proper way. So today we're going to do it a bit more proper. Pop your pot on the hob and we'll bring in some ingredients. Oh yeah. Okay. So what you have in front of you is a lot of individually prepared items. You've got some spinach, bean sprouts, you've got some mushrooms, you've got some kimchi, some watermelon radish, plus some bulgogi, which is quickly fried beef. It's got a wonderful marinade, including pear and mirin and garlic and ginger, an egg and bibimbap sauce. So I've, I've cooked on stone before, yeah. but never within a bowl. So the idea is they would heat up lots of stone bowls just in an oven, and then when it's ordered, they will basically construct it over a heat and then bring it to the table and it's literally sizzling and it means you get a crispy bottom, but all of the toppings look beautiful as well as tasting wonderful. Brush the inside of your bowl and then press in some of your cooked short grain rice. God, that's, that's hot. That is, and that is melty. That's quite melty. I feel like we're being given <laughs> such bad instructions right now. I think, I think I've ruined it right. <laughs> Brush it around the inside with a bit of kitchen roll. Rice goes in. Oh yeah, that's what you want. If you think about South Korea, it's a place that has very, very cold winters. So a dish that comes to the table in a hot stone bowl that is still hot is a brilliant concept. Now start to layer in your other bits. Just the yolk goes in the middle, and then plenty of your bibimbap sauce. The bibimbap sauce is gochujang with soy, sesame oil, mirin, a little bit of sugar, ginger, garlic, those kind of ingredients. You'll notice a little bit of beef and an awful lot of wonderful vegetables. So it's actually a really quite a sort of nutritious mix as well. And bibimbap literally means mixed rice. So bap being rice and bibim being the mixing. And so. Would you like to see one that our food team have prepared? No. We can combine. I'm, I'm proud of that. If, I'm gonna see, if I see what they have done, it's only make realise how badly we've done. Imagine it will look just the same. Coming in. So we're eating this Korean style. I have some spoons for you. Mixy. So literally bibbing back, mix it all up. It's really satisfying. And hopefully <laughs> it's got a nice crispy base. It carries on cooking and crisping at the table for the diner as well. Look at that crispy bottom. Nice. And tuck in, see what you think. That's phenomenal. I've had bibimbap before, but I've never had it with that proper crispy bottom and I hadn't realised how much that the dish needs that crunch. Mm. The mm. egg yolk makes it so glossy and rich, mm. doesn't it? I had heard of it. I've never actually done it in practice. And now we've done that, it's so easy. And I imagine these are relatively affordable. Yeah. Well, there's no reason why I couldn't do this at home and why I wouldn't want to. What I quite like the throwback to, Mike, was your touch in not too long ago, where you put the rice in and crisp at the bottom and then turn it out. To do something like this in a non-stick pan with similar ingredients you've got there, you could easily do an open side one of these to share as opposed to an individual portion if you haven't got the stone bowls at home. The beauty is the crisping of the rice underneath whilst you begin to layer it. I had to get myself some stone bowls. Yeah. Why not? They look great as well, don't they? Yeah. Mm. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm... I'm... <laughs> okay. It looks more like something using textiles than cooking. Yeah, it's more dried. That's more edible. Imagine that was wrapping something that sort of shape. Corn. I think it's... Corn husks. They are corn husks. And they become the perfect 
vehicle to steam something like tamales. So they are in fact cooked in the corn husk and inside of that you make a dough from corn and then you can put any number of fillings inside. Do you want to try wrapping some up? Oh yes! So what you have in front of you is some masa dough which is made from corn that has gone through an incredible process that makes it more digestible, more malleable uh, and more nutritional. It's a process called nixtilamization. So basically they take the corn and they basically cook it in an alkaline solution, which could simply be with ash. So ash from the fire goes in. And what that does is break down like the hemicellulose around the outside and some of the pectin to make it easier to work with and turn into a dough. It also makes some of the nutrients in it more bioavailable. So what you can do is spread some out onto your husk and then fill it with a little bit of pulled pork down the middle and then roll it up. So these traditionally would have come from Central America thousands of years ago. Guatemala, Costa Rica, Nicaragua. Then they can be steamed for, well, up to an hour. Would you like to try something we have been steaming for an hour? Oh, yes. yes. Go on, Basil. Okay. Let's have a look. Ooh, they look better than ours. Like with any dumpling or kind of food parcel, and I even put things like ravioli into that category, the more you do it, the better you get. And actually it's quite an art, quite a skill, but quite a social one where people would gather around and make these through a, over a conversation. You've also got two little salsas there. One's a red chili and one is a tomatillo. That is fantastic. Ooh. That red chili is so <laughs> How do you do it without the, out of the husk? You could absolutely, if you can't get hold of the husks, wrap them up in something like greaseproof paper. You could do it in tin foil even. The thing I like about these is as dumpling making goes, it doesn't have to be perfect. You can give it a go, you can mess it up, it'll still taste delicious. And do they use the, the corn husks to steam anything else? A bit like banana leaf, they're great for steaming fish. But again, that could be a filling within this or as a separate dish. Yeah, it's really cool. And it's just, yeah, another example of amazing sort of home cooking from around the world. How hard is it to make the dough? Providing somebody else has done the nixtamalization for you, then you can buy this quite easy. So this is just white masa harina or oh, great. masa flour, maize flour. It's the same stuff you'd use to put into corn tortillas as well. Essentially, you just mix it together with fat, chicken stock, salt, garlic powder, and you make a kind of dough out of it. And as long as the, the lard is, is soft enough to shape, like, like if you're making a cookie dough, you end up with a cookie dough consistency. I'm blown away by how greaseproof it is. It's because it's got a lot of lard in it. Oh, that'll be it. If I rubbed you in lard, you'd be pretty slippery as well. <laughs> What the f... Okay, Sorted so your it's eggs. All, it's all salt baked egg. But it's the white of the egg you're going to need. Salty meringue? Combined <laughs> with the salt to salt bake food. Now Jamie did a salt baked chicken. Which is the best chicken. Oh yeah, God, this has not it? Well, we're not going to do salt baked chicken today. We're going one better. Salt baked carrots. Oh, uh, what? <laughs> So, from my understanding of salt baking, it's something that basically makes sure the moisture all stays within. It stops any of the flavour getting out, but this at the same time seasons. And the salt crust protects the cooking, so it takes a while to get through, and when it does, it's more even and gentle cooking. It does all these wonderful things, so you're about to give it a go. Add the salt in, egg whites, some fennel seeds, some cumin seeds. Now place a layer on the tin foil. You can just put actually one carrot on top um, and then cover it in more slurry. So the whole thing is encased in about a centimetre thick of your salt crust. So how long are we cooking this carrot for? 180 to 200 degrees Celsius, maybe half an hour, 40 minutes. Can I swap this for a cooked one? Oh, hello. Okay, wow, all right. Find the carrot within. Can't believe we're playing find the carrot with others. <laughs> Here's to the best carrot we've ever, 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 ever eaten. Ever. 
very salty. It's really <laughs> salty. I quite like that. It What's tastes very carroty. It's more earthy. We did one carrot because it's an easy way to demonstrate the salt bake and how you lock it in. What's happened there is an awful lot of the salt has seasoned a little bit of the carrot. So perhaps it is better when you do bigger things. A salt baked celeriac, a salt baked beetroot. We've done salt baked whole flat fish I've done before in restaurants. There is one other thing we had to play around with today, which we'll bring in now. Is that a leg? That is a salt baked leg of lamb. Okay. If it's worked correctly, high temperature doesn't attack the lamb, but it attacks the casing. So it was seared, then in a hot oven for about 40 minutes and then taken out. And then that slowly, over about an hour of resting, slowly permeates the lamb so you get a much more even cooking all the way through that's more gentle. Oh, look at that, yeah. Wow, I've never ever eaten lamb that tender. A that leg, a leg. Absolutely delicious. A leg takes, that sort of size leg would take at least like an hour and a half. And what you end up doing is overcooking parts of it yeah. in order to cook it all the way through to the bone. This means you get that temperature kind of trapped in. The salt crust protects it and seasons it all in one. It's amazing, it doesn't taste salty either. It just right. tastes really lamby. There is no denying that this tastes incredible. I can imagine ordering a salt bake leg of lamb from a restaurant, because I can see how that, with that carved like that, I'd appreciate it. For me, like, I wouldn't do this on a Sunday roast. When you cracked into a whole leg of lamb, did your jaw drop? Yeah, yeah, I was staggered that that was the result, to be fair. I've never seen a leg of lamb like that, so. Fair play. Jaw dropped, or drawers dropped. That's a very different story. <laughs> Should we try number four anyway? <laughs> oh, he's not lying. <laughs> we have an app. It's called Sidekick, and yeah, we bang on about it a lot, but that's because we think it's really good. It gets three phenomenal, easy to make dinners from just one shopping list of ingredients and thousands of you are already using it. It also is completely free for 30 days. And to make the most of that trial and so that you can really test it out properly, we've put together the Sidekick Challenge. Three meals is all it takes and we explain everything in a full run through demo of the app and why we think it's so clever. Click the link below to find out everything. Number four, this is a bit of a DIY experiment. Oh, what? Mate! <laughs> Mate, <laughs> what? Oh, it stinks. These, just for clarity, are paper clips. Here you go. Yep, they are vinegared paper clips. Before you stick a paper clip through something, you want to make sure it is sterilised and distilled vinegar will do that for you. Do you want your next clue? We are talking about biltong, dried, hanging. preserved, cured meat from South Africa. It's like jerky, although it is a slightly different process and from a different part of the world. So that chunk of meat in front of you is something like a top side or silver side. Cut it in half and then into long, thick strips. You're then going to cure it in a mixture of five tablespoons of balsamic vinegar, three tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce, two tablespoons of coarse salt, two tablespoons of cracked black pepper, three tablespoons of cracked coriander seed, one tablespoon of brown sugar, and to limit the bacterial growth, half a teaspoon of bicarb. When they make it commercially, they use curing salt anyway. This is a way of doing it at home. But basically, you're creating an environment where it's fizzy. bacteria on beef can't live. Now you might want to wash your hands, Mike, yeah. and we'll swap out some that's already had that process. Now, up until now, this is a process we're quite familiar with that has been marinating overnight. So obviously you've sterilised the paper clips, make sure you sterilise your fingers too, and then hook a paper clip between each one and you're going to hang it in the oven. The oven is going to be on, but without temperature. In the bottom of the oven, there is a tray of salt. The salt helps take the humidity out of the air, but also any dripping juices from the beef as it does dry will catch on the salt and prevent damaging the bottom of your oven. For four or five days, you're going to air dry that beef in the oven. So we did DIY chorizo, and I, in my flat, was hanging bits of chorizo 
in the spare oh, bedroom that one. and I had to sterilize the hook oh. and they stunk out the, <laughs> the spare room for about five days. You could have put them in the oven. Um, yeah, it turns out I could have put them in the oven. I've <laughs> gone hungry for five days. This really? isn't homemade, is it? This No, this is stuff we have bought from a South African butcher. However, once you've got it hanging in there, it can take, depending on the size of the beef strips and the, the temperature and the humidity of the room, anywhere between two days and a week to dry. You've got two long examples there. One is particularly dry and one is what they would call wet um, and it's just soft, it hasn't been dried as much. If you're talking about technicalities, EHO class it to be safe once it's lost 30% of its weight in water by drying out. Means that's what this is at and it's been done with a similar spice blend to the one you just made. So what you're saying is as well, don't try this at home. I, I wouldn't recommend people give this a go at home unless they've done a lot of additional research. Kush has. Oh, it's good, isn't it? Proper chewy. Then the, there come the flavours. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Oh, I think I might leave it there, lads. Treat it like chewing gum. It's not the kind of thing you quickly chew and swallow. What they would do is take slices of this really dry biltong and literally throw it in a rucksack or a pocket. And then when you're out in the ranch, you can throw a piece in and chew it like chewing gum and it slowly releases the flavour and the spice and the funk and the energy. Wow, that is a, that is a, a lot of salty, beefy beautiness, beautifulness coming from a bit of chewing gum. And the final nod here is if you've got lots of offcuts, you can mince all the offcuts and put it into some form of intestine. This is probably a sheep's intestine or something and then dry it the same way and you end up with the sausage. I love my cured meats, um, but they, I start losing it when it gets a bit too funky. And for me, that, <clears throat> that wet one straight away was, was the funkiest of them all. Mm. And they got s steadily sweeter as it went along. I think that's why I prefer the sausage. Don't think I'd try it myself. It's just really cool mm. knowing how something I'm quite familiar with and have tried mm. is made. I feel like we've done a real mixture today from stone bowl cooking to steaming in husks, salt baking and dehydrating. But comment down below, have you tried or do you use any of those methods regularly? And as always, keep your suggestions coming in for more cooking approaches or methods or techniques that we can look at next time. steaming in husk, salt baking and hydrating. You said hydrating, not dehydrating, sorry. Unusual for me to forget the D. <laughs> <laughs> yes! Dehydrating. Oh, very good, <laughs> very good. <laughs>